As we prepare ourselves for worship today, bring us together in the name of Christ as one body with many members. We pray together in your name. Dear God, we call upon you today to hear our voices. Even though we trust you, we turn away from you. Even though we love you, we fail you every day. Teach us instead to better understand the difference between love and hate, and to behave accordingly. Remind us of the needs of our neighbors. Show us how to love them as we love ourselves. Teach us to be still and listen for your voice amidst the noise that surrounds us. Help to bring us closer to you and your love today as we hear your word. Let us hear your word in a new way, in a new light clarity of mind, and an open heart. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Today I'm going to read you a story from the Jesus Storybook Bible. And if you have this book at home, you can find this story on page 116. And the story is called The Teeny Weeny True King. God's people had a new land. Now they wanted a king. But God is your king, Samuel told them. He is the one who looks after you best. We want a real king, they said, one we can see. God knew that a king might not be kind to his people or look after them as well as he would. But God's people didn't care. They wanted a king and they wanted him now. So God gave them a king. He was called Saul and he seemed like a good king at first, but he became proud and stopped listening to God. He didn't obey God or love God with his whole heart. Saul can't help me with my plan, God said. I need a king who loves me and will teach my people to love me. I need a true king. God had just the one in mind. Go to Bethlehem, God told Samuel. You'll find the new king there. Samuel's job was to listen to God and tell people what God said. So Samuel went to the little town of Bethlehem. God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house. God was going to choose one of Jesse's sons to be the new king. Jesse had seven strong sons. Now, in those days, if you were going to be the king, you didn't have to be the richest or the cleverest although that was always nice. You had to look like a king, which meant you had to be the tallest and the strongest. So you could carry the, the longest swords and the biggest armor and defeat everyone. And it didn't hurt to be handsome either. So Samuel asked Jesse to bring him each son in turn. Jesse brought the oldest, tallest, strongest son. This must be the new king, Samuel thought. He looks like a king. God didn't choose him. You're thinking about what he looks like on the outside, God told Samuel. But I'm looking at his heart, what he looks like on the inside. So Jesse showed Samuel his next oldest, tallest, strongest son. But God didn't choose him either. In fact, God didn't choose any of the seven sons. Samuel said, is that all? Jesse laughed. Well, there's the youngest one, but he's just the weakling of the family. He's only teeny. Bring him, said Samuel. 
Jesse's youngest son came running up. And God spoke quietly to Samuel. This is the one. His name was David. He has a heart like mine, God said. It's full of love. He will help me with my secret rescue plan. And one of his children's children's children will be the king. And that king will rule the world forever. Samuel anointed David's head with oil, which was a special way to show that you were God's chosen king. You will be the new king one day, Samuel told him. And sure enough, when he grew up, David became king. God chose David to be king because God was getting his people ready for an even greater king who was coming. Once again, God would say, go to Bethlehem. You'll find the new king there. And there, one starry night in Bethlehem, in the town of David, three wise men would find him. Have a wonderful Sunday. Bye. Today's reading is from Psalm chapter. Trust in God for deliverance from enemies. To the leader for the flutes, a Psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. For not a God who delights in wickedness, evil will not sojourn with you. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, what enter your house? I will bow down toward your holy temple and awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness, because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. No truth in their mouths. Their hearts are destruction. In their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. May them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of their many transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, so that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. There is a popular expression that we often use for something that we perceive is so bad that we say, I wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy. So, of course, I got to thinking, what would I wish upon my worst enemy then? Well, fortunately, the internet has an answer for that question. There's a meme about that. So here are the top ten things according to the all-knowing internet, that most of us would actually be okay with wishing upon our worst enemies. Number 10, a long life full of tables with uneven legs. Number nine, seat back, food on lap, drink in hand, remote control across the room. Number eight, the polite scorn of a Canadian. 
Number seven, a predisposition to accidentally hitting reply all on emails. Number six, bountiful amounts of stray Legos on the living room floor at midnight. Number five, clamshell packaging on everything. Number four, the world's smallest water heater. Number three, open parking spaces that turn out to have tiny cars in them. Number two, a fork that always lands in the syrup accompanied by a spoon that always falls into the bowl. And the number one thing that, according to the internet, most of us would be okay wishing upon our greatest enemies, lots and lots of video with incorrectly synchronized audio. I hope that last one isn't prophetic, given our new experiment today using Facebook Live. Um, we don't actually wish that upon. If you're watching this and my lips aren't synchronizing with what I'm saying, you are not our worst enemy. It just happened that way. Our scripture reading today, Psalm 5, and you are invited to follow along. If you brought your Bible today, if you brought a, a smartphone, you're welcome to follow along that way too. Our scripture today is Psalm 5, and it's a prayer of complaint against one's enemies. The instructions at the beginning of the psalm tell us that it is a psalm of David, and David had plenty of enemies during his lifetime, so that makes sense. The instructions also address this psalm to the leader. Presumably, this is the leader of worship in the temple in ancient Jerusalem. Now, I can identify with that a little bit as a worship leader here at First Presbyterian Church, I get a lot of complaints addressed to me. They're not usually quite as poetic as Psalm 5, but once someone did tell me that my sermon reminded her of the peace and love of God. Like God's peace, it was beyond all understanding, and like God's love, it endured forever. I'm not sure that was a compliment. Now, there's one more instruction at the beginning of Psalm 5. And this one indicates that the psalm was written to be accompanied by flutes. That may strike some of us as a little bit odd for a prayer of complaint against one's enemies. We typically don't think of the flute with its lovely and airy sound as something that you would accompany to a complaint against your enemies. Bagpipes, maybe, but not so much the flute. I want you to hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to the flute part later on in the sermon. But first, let's jump into the actual verses of the psalm. Psalm 5 begins, like so many psalms and prayers, with an invocation calling out upon the name of God. Verse 1, give ear to my words, O Lord, give heed to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. But it's not until verse 3 that we get our first hint, our first glimpse of the real situation that is provoking this prayer. In verse 3, the psalmist says, O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. Now, there are two possible reasons why you might rise up early in the morning to pray to God. One is because you are amazingly faithful and disciplined in your prayer life. But that's probably not most of us. The other reason you might rise up early in the morning to pray to God is because you couldn't sleep. Because you were lying awake all night long worrying about your problems. And when the sun came up in the morning, the only thing left to do was to cry out to God. Psalm 5, verse 3, in the morning, I plead my case to you and watch. Now, some translations put that as I look up, as, in, as if in prayer to God. But I think the NRSV translation actually gets it right here. The word in Hebrew is tzafa, not to look up, but to look out, to look around, and to look over your shoulder. Remember, you are not paranoid if they really are out to get you. So who is coming to get 
our psalmist? Well, we don't know for sure, but it's probably lawyers. Or more specifically, someone who has leveled accusations against the psalmist in court. And there are clues to this. Listen to verse 5 and 6. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. And then later in verse 9, there is no truth in their mouths. Their hearts are destruction. Their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. I'm not suggesting that all of those things are connected with lawyers, but they are all connected with speech and specifically with accusations, with dangerous accusations. All of these are things related to words. Also, remember back in verse 3, the psalmist said, I plead my case to you, O God. That's legal terminology, pleading one's case, but it also indicates a pretty substantial lack of faith in the judicial system. I plead my case to you, O God, because I'm sure not going to get justice pleading my case in court. And if this psalm was indeed written by David, that would make a lot of sense for the times in his life when he was not the king, but an outlaw when all of the systems of power and authority were stacked against him so that no justice of any kind would have been possible except through God's intervention. It's also worth, worth noting as we read the words of this psalm that this is pretty strong language. These are strong accusations on the psalmist's part. This is divisive language occurring in prayer and that probably makes some of us uncomfortable, coming from the same Bible where Jesus tells his followers to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The author of Psalm 5 is certainly praying for his enemies, or rather for something to happen to his enemies, but I don't think it's exactly what Jesus had in mind. And that's actually something I love about the Psalms. You see, if Jesus is the reflection of who we should aspire to be, the Psalms are often a reflection of who we really are. One is the ending point, the goal. The other is the starting point, the picture of our present reality. But even in this Psalm, even in Psalm 5, there is a small perceptible shift, a movement in that direction towards that goal. I like to think of Psalm 5 as a cooling off psalm or a one, two, three, time out kind of psalm. It starts off hot. Lord, please destroy those bloodthirsty, deceitful evildoers. Smash them to smithereens. Now, that kind of prayer may not be ideal, but it's definitely honest and even if you've never quite prayed those words, chances are you've thought things like that in your heart before. But then comes a turning point in verse 7. The psalmist says, after talking about his enemies, he says, but I, and here's what I will do in response to my accusers. Note that he doesn't say, I am going to destroy them in the name of God. He doesn't say, I am going to say mean things about them like they've been saying about me. No. He says, but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I'll go to the temple. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. In other words, my enemies are all focused intensely on me but I will not focus on them. I will focus my thoughts on you, God, and on your steadfast love. Breathe in, breathe out, take a sip of coffee, go to church, write something to your pastor. Remember that the next time you're mad unless you're mad at your pastor, in which case, just skip that last part. The psalmist then in verse 8 takes things up a notch and says, Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of 
my enemies. Make your way straight before me. And I love this. He's saying, for their sake, God, for my enemies' sake, don't let me follow their example. For my enemies' sake, God, let me follow your example so that I can be an example to them. Don't destroy them, but help me to reach them. And if they still refuse to hear, then, verse 10, make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Now, that's not the same as the psalmist's earlier call for God to utterly destroy them. Instead, it's a plea for justice, fairness, karma. Let them see and experience the consequences of their own actions, their own behavior. And then, having calmed down considerably, the psalmist finally turns his focus away from his persecutors altogether and ends his prayer with thankfulness, with confidence in God's protection, even joy in the simple act of singing and worshiping and loving God, verse 11 and 12. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Now, I told you we'd come back to the part about the flutes. Why is a psalm of complaint written to be accompanied by such a specific musical instrument? And this is also the only time in all of the psalms that that particular instruction shows up. Flutes are mentioned elsewhere in the Bible and in the psalms, but this is the only time when a psalm is instructed to be accompanied by a specific instrument, and it's the flute. I think there's something calming, something soothing about the light and airy tone of the flute and any of its various incarnations across different times and cultures. Did you know that there is some kind of a flute in every single culture going back as far as archaeology uh, tells us? In fact, I believe one of the most ancient instruments ever discovered was a hollowed out bone flute. So. It's a pervasive instrument in all cultures. And I think the flute and the music of the flute has the power, the unique power to take our anxieties, our anger, our darkest thoughts, and redirect them toward beauty and love and joy and the creation around us. In the early days of this pandemic we find ourselves in, in the midst of our anxiety about COVID-19 and shelter-in-place orders, Bethany Treadway, who was our, is our guest musician today, picked up her flute, went outside, and recorded some simple, familiar hymns, posting them to her Facebook page. To me and to many others who heard those songs, they were a quiet, calming reminder of God's faithfulness and love. But there's another aspect of the flute, a totally different aspect, that I think also makes it quite fitting for this psalm, for Psalm 5. At the high end of its register, the flute cuts across all other instruments, clear and crisp, some would even say shrill and piercing. Interestingly, the Hebrew word for flutes that appears in this passage, nehilot, is derived from an even older Hebrew word, halal, which is the word for flute, and it also means to pierce. And probably that's because that's how you make a flute. You pierce holes in, uh, in a stick. But it's a great coincidence that the name for flute in Hebrew is the sound that it makes. It's piercing. And that shrill, piercing sound that the flute is capable of making is like the shrill, piercing cry for justice that also weaves its way throughout Psalm 5. Not the call for anger or destruction, but the persistent demand of the psalmist for righteousness to prevail. 
You see, the flute is the only instrument I know that can seamlessly go back and forth between those two different emotions and particular expressions, soothing and calming, to piercing and challenging, holding those two things together in balance, like the psalm itself does, so that neither one is forgotten or eclipsed by the other. And that kind of balance at the end of the day, is a good thing to strive for in our prayers, in our worship, in our lives. Yes, we do often cry out to God in anger, fear, or frustration, and the Psalms teach us that that's okay. That's part of what prayer is for. But sometimes, through the very act of prayer itself, God calms our restless hearts brings us back to our centering point and reminds us again of the vast and beautiful universe that we inhabit. Not to distract us from our plea or cry for justice, but to remind us of our place and our role in that universe, our role in bringing God's justice to bear in the world. And in that universe that God reminds us of, each one of us, plays a very small but very important part. Weaving our voices, our prayers, our songs together with countless others, past, present, future, in the majestic symphony of God's love and grace. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and God, In difficult times, we often fall to our knees, crying out in anger and anguish and frustration. We know that you hear those cries. You listen to your children. But Lord, you also calm our hearts. You turn that frustration into purpose. Help us to be purposeful as we go about inhabiting this world that you made. Help us to, in a time where we are supposed to refrain from embracing, help us to embrace others through our simple acts of kindness, through our songs, through an encouraging word or a smile. Help us to embrace and show your love in these kinds of ways. Help us to be your hands and your feet in this world so that it will become the just world that we cry out for in our prayers. Lord, we pray all of these things just as you have taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Our praise band is in place, and in just a few minutes, we are going to sing our closing song. But before that, I wanted to share with you some announcements about things that are going on in the life of our congregation and ways in which you can participate. The first one is Wandering Calvin. Calvin has made several appearances in our community. He got to hang out with Ethan and Sebastian Wright. He got stuck in a tree, got to eat some vegetables in a garden. He also made an appearance with uh, Barbara Christopher, I think, who shared coffee with Calvin appropriately. I think there's another one of Calvin enjoying his coffee and his Bible study. 
If you would like to have Calvin come and visit your home so that you can take fun pictures and send them out to our community, this is just a way for us to connect with each other and learn about each other uh, a little bit more and be able to share in community together. Oh, that's right. I'm supposed to sit in my chair so I can actually be seen on the camera for announcements. Uh, Tonight at 7 o'clock p.m., our sister church, the Metropolitan Community Church of El Paso, is uh, observing a pride worship service. June is Pride Month, and so they are going to um, have a service on Zoom of equality and justice. I will be attending that service and playing the bagpipes for them. You are invited to join in also. It's also on Facebook Live, just like this service. You can uh, search Facebook Live for Metropolitan Community Church of El Paso uh, and um, go log on to the feed at 7 o'clock. This is a great way to support uh, our sister church in, um, in a very important movement. All right. Uh, also, another thing going on this month, our partners, the Libra Institute, uh, are hosting a grassroots leadership academy. If you've ever wanted to become more involved in your community, learn how to do community activism. This is a class that provides a certification process for that. Um, there is information on how to sign up and register for that class on our church website. And uh, we certainly encourage anyone who would has any questions to reach out to us or to one of our church members, Carla Sierra, who is the regional representative for Libra Institute. We need help. We need help from those of you who are in this room and those of you who are watching at home. Uh, as you've seen, we have been recording several elements of the worship service to try to keep everyone connected with each other. So we need people to record uh, scripture readings, prayers, especially the chiming of the hour, and we're trying to incorporate those things in our worship um, to truly be a community in a time where some of us are here, some of us are there, and some of us are elsewhere. So if you would like to volunteer to do any of those things to help us lead this worship service, please let us know, and uh, you can do that via our church website, which is firstpresbyterian.church, or you can reach out to me or anyone on our Facebook chat that's happening right now. And I want to thank everyone who has continued to support our church financially through all of this. There are several ways that you can give to First Presbyterian Church. Not all of them are financial, but that's a pretty important one too. If you are here in the building on your way, we're not going to pass the offering plate, but on your way out, the offering plates are present on the table in the narthex. We would invite you to um, Use that as a way to contribute to the work that our church is doing in our community. If you are watching online, or even if you're here in the building, you can also go to our website, firstpresbyterian.church, where there are instructions for how to give online. If you have a smartphone and you use the Venmo app, you can find us on Venmo and make donations to the church in that way as well. Another way to contribute is to make a contribution to our, uh, one of our favorite Eagle Scouts who's standing right here next to me, Jacob Halter. Actually, you can't see, well, you can see his picture, but he's actually, the real Jacob is behind the picture on the screen, and those of you who are in the building can see him. Jacob is uh, beginning his Eagle Scout project. He has chosen First Presbyterian Church as his beneficiary and is going to build a sound booth to house all of our technology, which is right now spread out all over the place. He's already raised over $1,000 towards his $2,000 goal, but still has a ways to go. If you would like to support him by making a donation, to his Eagle Scout project. We would encourage you to do that. It helps him, it helps us, and ultimately it helps you too to be able to hear and participate in worship. Uh, you can make a donation to First Presbyterian Church putting Eagle Scout project in the memo line and we'll make sure those funds get to the right place. Finally, we want to wish a happy birthday to those who are celebrating birthdays this week, including Abigail Norton, Joyce Henry, and Emily Curlin. If you see any of those folks, please make sure to wish them a happy birthday and let them know how much we appreciate them as part of our faith community. At this time, we are going to sing our closing song. It's a familiar one. We're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, and we invite you to remain seated and sing along. We, we also need to wish a happy birthday to Becky Lennon. No, actually, she asked me not to. <laughs> I couldn't skip her. <laughs> uh, 
I was being good, Becky, I promise. I'm sorry, Becky. <laughs> All right, we're going to sing Be Thou My Vision. Please join us and, and sing along.
Amen, and a big thank you to Bethany Treadway for being our guest soloist today and joining us on the flute. And now, as all of you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Those of you who are watching online, uh, since we're not doing Zoom, you're welcome to stick around and chat with each other and share God's peace there. Those of you who are here in the building, we ask that you remask yourself, and when you are outside of the building in the open air at a nice safe distance, that would be a great time to wave at each other and share God's peace and God's love as we go. Have a wonderful, blessed day, and we'll see you again next Sunday.